Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on uh, what part of the country you're all in. Um, so thank you all for joining today's webinar. Um, we are fortunate to have Jerry uh, here with us today, and he's going to present on where electricity and light meet, the power of infrared spectro -electro electrochemical techniques in observing surface chemistry. Say that 10 times fast. So the um, go ahead here and talk a little bit about some logistics for the webinar. Um, so this is going to be recorded. So if you know someone who might benefit from this information, or if you miss a part of the webinar, it will be posted on our YouTube channel after the fact. So a couple quick things. Um, if you have questions during the webinar about Jerry's technical topic related to you know, the title we just went through, please use the Q&A box for that. And Vishal and myself will field those questions to Jerry in real time. If you have questions about Zoom, if you can't hear things, or if you have an issue with the Zoom interface itself, please use the chat window for those types of questions. All right. So my name is Zach Gray. I'm the managing director for the Center for Nanotechnology Education and Utilization. Um, Vishal is our co-host. So Vishal, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself real quick to everybody. Yeah, uh, I'm Vishal Sarvade, and I'm an assistant teaching professor, again, with CNEU at Penn State. Excellent. Thank you. So Vishal and myself will be fielding your questions throughout the webinar and giving them to Jerry. And then our presenter today uh, is a fourth year graduate student in the Asbury Group at Penn State University. Um, he goes by just Jerry, so feel free to um, you know, get it, give it Jerry any questions you may have throughout the webinar. Once again, uh, please use the Q&A for your technical questions for Jerry. Here is Jerry's bio. And Jerry, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. And uh, we look forward to your presentation today. Thanks, Zach. So uh, my name is Jerry. Um, so I was raised in Japan and China before I came to United States for, uh, for my bachelor's degree in biochemistry at UCSD. At UCSD, I work with QBAC group on studying the ultrachemical carbon dioxide reduction to CO using group seven metal catalysts. I then uh, moved to Penn State in 2019 to join the Asbury group at Pennsylvania State University and studying the development of analytical tool to study the electrochemical interfaces of metal electrodes using infrared spectroscopy, which is the main topic today. And interesting story, uh, I ran into Vishal in the cafe and he invited me for the seminar talk. So I feel really frightened, but also very honored to uh, give a talk to you guys from different backgrounds. And uh, yes, so, um, Today, my topic is about um, talking about the analytical tools to analyze and monitor the surface chemistry on the electrodes. So to start with our today's talk, so let's talk a little bit about uh, some uh, global problems that we're facing right now. Firstly, um, according to data from 2011 US Environmental Information Administration, uh, in about 100 years, humans are going to be running out of the reserves of the fossil fuels, so that we're not going to have enough natural gases and oil to power our uh, electricity and automobiles. Another problem we're facing is the problem of greenhouse gas emissions, which coming from our daily activities, such as transportation, electricity generations, and running power plants, and so on. Those greenhouse gas emissions can cause a lot of global environmental issues, that are well known, such as the ozone gas depletion from the fluorinated gases. Uh, methane and carbon dioxide are known to raise the global temperatures by several degrees, which will cause the rise of the sea level and also the seawater acidification, which may kill many biodiversities. So uh, humans are in need of a renewable, but also carbon neutral alternative energy to live a more sustainable life. And right now, humans were able to um, find some alternative to fossil fuels, such as wind energy, solar energy, and hydropower energy to um, <coughs> reduce the burden on fossil fuels. However, those uh, energies 
also have their own problem because uh, it usually will take a lot of time and money to build facilities as well as doing the maintenance of those uh, power plants. They're also dependent on the weather and locations. So uh, scientists were looking for alternatives that are uh, much cheaper, uh, having more access to people, but also having a wider range of usage. And electrocatalysis is considered one of the promising solutions to this problem. Uh, here I'm just showing a schematic of a hydrogen fuel cell that can produce electricity and only produce water as the byproduct. And uh, right now, uh, there are a lot of uh, motivations in industries and also academics to uh, incorporate the hydrogen fuel cell into automobiles, uh, use it to power the power plants and also deliver electricity to buildings and households. So to begin with, let's talk a little bit about the electrochemistry and electrocatalysis. Again, here I'm showing a schematic of uh, hydrogen fuel cell. Electrochemistry is a branch of chemistry marked by the movement of electrons from one to other reactants. And in, in this specific uh, fuel cell diagram, there are two compartments. One is the uh, anode, where the oxidation reactions of the hydrogen gases to protons happening. This is also the reaction that will generate uh, electrons, which will go through an external circuit to produce electricity. Uh, the protons will go through a electrolyte membrane, usually made of polymers, diffused to another part of the fuel cell, which is the cathode compartment, where the uh, production reaction of oxygen uh, proceed to produce water as the byproduct. As long as you have a sustainable supply of hydrogen, usually stored in the hydrogen tank, and oxygen supply from the air, you can run this hydrogen fuel cells to provide a uh, sustainable electricity at a reasonable rate. And what's supporting this sustainable rate of electricity generation is usually the uh, existence of uh, electro catalysts, which are usually metal catalysts that were coated on, the, on top of the electrodes. For example, uh, on the castle, of the hydrogen fuel cell, there is usually platinum metal film or platinum black film that were usually uh, deposited on the electrical surfaces to um, speed up the reaction. Electrocatalysis can not only improve the reaction rate by uh, lowering the activation barrier of the reaction, but also improve the selectivity of the reaction by uh, modifying the mechanisms and uh, only go through the reaction that we desired and uh, avoid any uh, unwanted byproduct formations. However, um, the process of the electrocatalysis and electrochemistry is very, very complex. It usually involves reactants that were in different phases. And these processes are dynamic processes that happen on different time scales. So it's very different to differentiate between one to the other. For example, uh, in the electrocatalysis in the uh, aqueous solutions, it first involves the formation of an electrical double layer. So it happens when a metal electrode or a metal catalyst is getting charged. The counter ions will first absorb onto surfaces in close distance. And then the solvated ions surrounded with water molecules will absorb, also absorb onto the surfaces with long range electrical set forces. And then outside those two layers, you will have the diffusing uh, reactants in either gas form or liquid form going in and out of the double layer to do the reaction. Uh, for example, here I'm showing a CO2 reduction <clears throat> mechanisms on the silver surfaces. You're always having those gas reactants of carbon dioxide coming in, absorb onto the surfaces, to go, go through some transformation and leave the surfaces at certain rates. And those processes, again, those, those processes are dynamic and they happen at different rates. So scientists have been really limited to understand those processes by just doing the ex situ measurements or doing measurements before and after in electrochemical reactions. 
which further making scaling of the electrocatalytic process for industrial process very challenging. So in order to understand the process much better and having a good picture of the electrocatalytic process, there's a need to characterize the electrocatalyst uh, in situ or in real time. A more conventional uh, characterization of the catalyst, you'll first make the catalyst and the characterize them knowing their morphology, knowing uh, what's the crystal structure of the catalyst. In most of the industry labs and the academic labs, we also involve in doing the performance tests by testing its electrochemical activity, see if you can pr produce a much higher current. You can uh, produce, um, you can see the product distribution of the catalyst to see that if you uh, can make the reactant more efficient. Uh, right now in the field, there's more, um, there's emerging uh, interest in doing the in-situ mechanistic studies of the electrochemical reactions so that we can both characterize the surfaces but also doing the performance test by looking at the chemical intermediate form during the electrochemical reactions so that we know that uh, what chemical species were formed, um, uh, when, what, by what time when the catalyst fell, uh, what are some poison species on the electrodes that were blocking the active sites of the materials so that we can provide hints to the synthetic chemists as like a design rules so that they can <clears throat> modify the catalyst surfaces to avoid those problems. And today I'm going to focus on one of the analytical tools that were used in the field to characterize the surface species on the electrode. It's called the attenuated total reflectance infrared spectroscopy, short for ATR series, to study the electrochemical interfaces. So I'm going to break this technique in parts and by parts to, um, to help you understand this technique. Firstly, um, Let's talk a little bit about the infrared spectroscopy. So this is a very widely used uh, vibrational spectroscopy technique in many academic labs and industry labs to characterize the molecular species. This is caused by the uh, excitation of the molecular vibrations inside the samples by infrared light. And the light will be transmitted to the detector to provide a infrared spectrum like the one below. This is a infrared spectrum for water. On the left are some typical <clears throat> molecular vibration of uh, uh, being simulated for water. For example, uh, for a symmetric stretch of water, you will see that the OH bond is getting, uh, OH bond is uh, getting shortened and elongated at the same rate in, into the oxygen atom. While in the bending mode, you will see that uh, the OH bond will moving vertically at the same rate. And those molecular vibrations will happen at different frequencies, therefore uh, uh, demonstrating different energies in a uh, infrared spectrum like this. In addition to providing uh, identification of the molecular species, there's also several uh, characteristics that we can take advantage of. Firstly, is the um, the infrared spectroscopy will follow the beer lambert law. Um, so, if we have a constant, where if we're studying the same sample, we can uh, we assume the molar absorption coefficient is constant, optical pass length is constant for using the same instrument. We can relate the uh, concentration of the surface form species to the absorbance of the spectrum. The second characteristic is that the wave number or the frequency of the molecular vibration is related to the mass and spring constant of chemical bond. So that it can help us to determine um, what are the chemical species formed on surfaces by doing some simulation calculations and also figure out any changes happens to the chemical bond under certain reaction conditions. And here I'm uh, on the on the talk, I'm here to show you a simple uh, demonstration of uh, IR spectrum taking in a transmission mode. And what's necessary for 
studying the electrochemical interfaces is the attenuated total reflectance geometry. And here, uh, let's review a little bit about some high school physics. Um, when one material enters another material with a higher refractive index, uh, you will uh, refract at a much larger incident, a much larger angle. And this has been described by the Snell's law on the top left. When you have incidence angles that were larger than the critical angle of this certain material, which is the incidence angles uh, making the uh, reflected angle of the reflected beam parallel to the interfaces between two materials, you will experience a internal reflection inside only the first materials. Uh, for example, in a typical infrared spectrometer, you basically think of the first material as air, and the second material will be any high refractive index uh, material, such as zinc selenide, germanium, silicon, diamond, and so on. And what's important about this total internal reflection is that during this process, part of the infrared light will penetrate through the reflecting plane of the crystal as, as a form in an evanescent wave. And this evanescent wave will have a ultra high sensitivity near the surface of the ATR crystal. And the sensitivity will decay exponentially with distances from the, from the uh, reflecting plane. So it makes us uh, accessible to study uh, surface species. There were about tens of nanometers or microns close to the to the ATR crystal, but also not getting too much interference from the aqueous solution because water usually have a really strong absorption in high wave number regions. And the penetration depths of this evidence wave have been described in this form here. It's dependent on wavelengths of the light as well as the angle of incidence. So typically, if you have a higher, higher incidence angle, you will have a higher um, penetration depth which can also be used to study reactions. Um, in addition to a ATR geometry, another tool is needed to uh, getting a uh, strong signals coming from surface species. Surface intermediates formed during electrochemical reaction are usually produced in very, very low concentration from millimolar uh, to micromolar sometimes below the detection limit for the infrared spectroscopy in conventional devices. So typically, um, chemists will put down some uh, metal film, such as gold, silver, or copper, uh, in order to enhance the IR signals. And this coming from a physical phenomenon called localized surface plasma resonance. And this happens when uh, infrared light interact with metal film, usually deposit in nanoscale from uh, several nanometers to tens of nanometers. And this will cause the electron cloud of the metal nanoparticles to, uh, to elongate it and produce dipoles, uh, which will create a enhanced local electric field around the nanoparticles. And when the molecules absorb onto those metal nanofilms, it will perturb the electrical cloud of metal nanoparticles at, the, at a frequency that's close to the wave number of the molecular vibration of the molecules. And this enhanced electric field will bring a response uh, to uh, magnify the signals of the molecular vibrations. So the metal nanoparticles becomes like an amplifier for the uh, vibrational frequency of the molecule so that we can see usually a tenfold to a hundredfold signal enhancement in the infrared spectrum. As you can see on the picture on the left, on the right, without that silver film, you can barely see AIR signals of the, of the absorbed molecule. But when you have a uh, silver film as under layer, you will see hundredfold enhancement. And when you have a larger aspect ratio of the metal lepsoid, meaning you have a higher ratio of the a over B, basically width over height of the molecules, you'll have a stronger enhancement of the signals. Because uh, 
this, this, this phenomenon is also called a lightning rod impact because we have an elongated <coughs> conductor. You have most of your charges accumulated at the tips of the electrodes. And when you have more elongated uh, nanoparticles, those uh, tips will overlap with each other. Uh, no, the, the tips will get closer to each other and the enhanced local electric field will overlap with each other to produce what's called a um, electrical hotspots where more enhanced uh, spectral signals can be uh, expected. And in order to uh, prepare those electrical underlayer to produce uh, higher signal enhancement, it's usually uh, <clears throat> uh, can be prepared in several ways such as magnetron sputtering, which is usually called a physical evaporation technique, uh, we, or by physical evaporation technique that were usually prepared in a uh, clean room. Another technique is uh, electroless plating, so plating method, which is you will dip the ATR crystal into a plating solution to undergo a autocatalytic process to um, coat film like copper, gold on your ATR crystal, uh, another uh, technique uh, that uh, disappeared a few years ago in the literature is that um, chemists put down some uh, conductive metal oxide films. Uh, they were iron tra transparent, but also conductive so that they can electrodeposit films such as gold and copper on top of it. And on the top right is just a, uh, just, it's just a photo of uh, gold film. I prepared for on the slick ATR prism. And, it's, and it is, and the copper foil or on top is used to provide electrical contact uh, for the reactions. And we have the tools of ATR uh, geometry and also a uh, electrical under layer. The last part we'll need is a reaction cell where the reaction electrochemical reactions will happen. So here I'm just pointing out some uh, different parts in the, in, my, in the setup that I use in our lab. First one is the gas inlet and outlet. Most electrochemical reactions that studied by uh, infrared spectroscopy is such as carbon dioxide reduction, uh, CO oxidation reaction, oxygen reduction reaction, usually involve purging. <clears throat> Uh, purging pure gases into solution. So it's, it's definitely necessary. Um, another part is the reaction cell. Um, in, in my lab, it is made of uh, glass and also uh, polyether ether ketin, which is a polymer material that's a uh, very hard plastic, uh, which is resistant to uh, chemicals, also resistant to acids, uh, strong acids and bases. Um, at the bottom, if you cannot see from this photo, is the one on the right. This is a, a commercially available ATR accessories that can provide ATR geometry. You study the chemical reactions. And uh, although it's not visible on this photo here, um, if you can see my mouse, the ATR crystal is mounted on top of the ATR accessories inside the, uh, peak, the peak cell. And uh, all the other parts are the electrodes. Uh, in a typical electrochemical cell study for electrochemical testing, there are a working electrode, reference electrode, and counter electrode. Working electrode is basically where the reaction is going to take place. In this case, a simple one will be a gold film <clears throat> that used for uh, electrical contact, but also uh, infrared enhancement. A reference electrode is used to provide a reference point so that you can make your number, that your number makes sense because potential is a relative unit. You would need a unit that were, uh, you would need a reference that were absolute. The counter electrode is just another part in the circuit uh, to complete the, the electrical loop. So uh, when you have, when you're oxidizing a working electrode, there will be a reduction reaction happening on the counter electrode to, to complete the electrical circuit. And of course, the design of the reaction cell can be hundreds 
depending on the labs and depending on the hypothesis you want to test. For example, in the literature, um, there's a uh, reaction cell as uh, in the H cell design. It's called H cell just because the shape looks like H. And there's a uh, usually a polymer membrane in between the two compartments of the cell in order to avoid the uh, cross-contamination between the two cells. Especially you care about the dissolution of the uh, common electrode into your uh, working electrode, which will might change the reaction mechanism. You definitely need this. Another uh, part, uh, another uh, different design in the literature is the cell involved in the stirring, uh, stirring uh, so that you can improve the mass transport of the cell. Uh, you know, so that you, you have the Azor species and Uthor species that were um, leaving, uh, that were uh, going into the electrodes, about to leave electrodes at a reasonable rate, while also not blocking the active site of electrodes to terminate your reactions. And uh, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about some procedures we typically use for um, studying those chemical reactions. And uh, so far, we've already discussed about uh, sample preparation. Basically, uh, you put on the electro on the layer, you can either deposit the, the electro catalyst. You want to study, you can electro deposit and film on that. You will uh, assemble the ATR crystal inside itself and put together like this. At the electrolyte, you will know your pH, the concentration of electrolyte. Pergenic gas, if you want, if you need some inner gases, add it, uh, definitely add it. If you're studying oxygen reduction or CO2 reduction, you will need to purge the solution with gases for some time so that you can saturate the electrolyte with the desired reactant. And this uh, whole experiment will involve the operation of two, um, two instruments simultaneously. Potential set is a uh, is a tool, analytical tool for electrochemical testing. You can control the current and potential um, by, uh, by using software interfaces. And FTIR is basically the IR spectrometer. And here I will give an example of a simple, uh, for, for a simple demonstration, which is the study of the CO absorption on platinum catalyst under different potentials. In a typical uh, measurement, you will first need to take a, excuse me, a background spectrum. And this, in this reaction, uh, we take a background spectrum at about 0.9 volt versus reversible uh, hydrogen electrode. This is a unit for the reference potential, a reference electron. This potential here is chosen because um, uh, by experience, uh, scientists know that uh, there's no seal, uh, seal absorption will happen in the surfaces. Seal will basically oxidize this to form CO2 at these surfaces above 0.8 and 0.8 volts. Next, it will change the applied potential and take new spectrum under, under uh, more negative potential in this case. And you will see that when you go to a much lower potential, you will see a growth of the uh, 27 wave number peaks and uh, 18, 50 wave number peaks. <clears throat> and uh, after, you after you observe those potentials, you look for literatures and do some calculations and scientists that figure out that uh, the higher wave number Peak is the linear bounded CO on the on the platinum surfaces, while the lower wave number peak is the bridge bounded uh, CO on the platinum surfaces. Another example I want to give is about um, we talk about ATR series can be used to study the reaction mechanisms during the chemical reactions. I want to give example for. Uh, carbon dioxide reduction reaction. Um, carbon dioxide reduction reaction is 
a very hot topic in the field of electrocatalysis because um, CO2 can be reduced to carbon monoxide, which can be further refined uh, to, uh, uh, which can be further uh, used to, uh, in the electric process called the Fischer trough process to produce liquid fills. In uh, some limited uh, metals such as copper, um, it can be used to produce uh, carbon two products such as acetyl or acetylene. They are very, very valuable chemicals, um, and they were highly desired in the field. And uh, to start with this, uh, we'll first look at the carbon dioxide reduction reactions happening on gold and copper. So gold is known for a catalyst, active catalyst for uh, CO2 electrochemical reduction for only producing CO as a uh, reduction product. And for after a few studies by ATR Saris and other uh, conventional techniques, it was found that the CO absorption on gold is rather, rather weak. So um, the interaction for, is so weak that it won't have enough time to uh, interact or interact with other azure species on surfaces such as water or surface azure hydrogen um, and undergo some transformation to become a carbon two product. Therefore, um, uh, the azure CO will uh, leave the surfaces very, very fast to produce carbon monoxide gas as the only product. And this has been demonstrated in, a, in many ADR series studies that usually see a uh, much uh, a, a high wave number uh, CO stretch at around 2100 wave numbers. And you will see this high wave number because of the high back bonding into CO bond, because the interaction between gold and carbon is so weak, <laughs> so that. Um, more electron density is uh, accumulated in the uh, in, in, in the pipe in the uh, CO bond here. And during the ATR series studies, uh, you, were, you would not see uh, any other peaks related to the carbon two products in low wave number regions are usually observed. On the other hand, uh, copper is known for uh, the only metal catalyst that can produce carbon two products in addition to carbon one products such as CO or uh, the same. It can produce acetylene, acetyl, and many other products and so on. And the reason why copper is such a good catalyst is because it's considered having a optimal uh, CO binding forces on copper surfaces so that it is not, uh, so that it won't leave surfaces too fast but also this interaction is not too strong so that it won't poison the surface sites to block them, to terminate their chemical reactions. And this is also being studied in the ATR series and with, with other techniques, usually found a much lower wave numbers for the uh, copper CO species during the electrochemical conditions. And in the spectrum, you usually see the multi-carbon product intermediates, such as a carbon-carbon double bond um, during the electrochemical uh, reactions. And the products such as acetylene and the acetyl has been uh, <clears throat> has been observed in situ uh, with the ATR series uh, measurements, and that's been confirmed by many research groups. Uh, Last but not least, uh, I want just to emphasize that uh, ATR series, although it's a very powerful technique, but it's still at, but we're still at the infancy of really observing and monitoring the electrochemical processes that happen on the electrochemical interfaces, because ATR series uh, can only do in simple studies, basically study the whole surface of electrodes. Uh, Actual, by, uh, that we cannot focus on just a few nanometers uh, area and see what's going on on the surfaces. Uh, ATR series also has uh, uh, not high enough time resolution 
we can only study reaction from milliseconds to two seconds, while many of the uh, bond breaking, bond formation process will happen at much, much faster time scale, maybe into uh, microsecond, uh, nanosecond, or even beyond. Therefore, uh, in the field, there are much more efforts going goes into um, leveraging this ATR-SERS technique into higher spatial resolution by incorporating the ATR-SERS with scanning tunneling microscope or AFM microscope to um, first trigger the reactions by a, a STM tip and also observe any changes to signals. Another uh, effort to improve the time resolution is to use a visible light pump light to um, excite the surface electrode on electrodes to instantaneously raise the temperature of the, of the electrode surfaces to, uh, to trigger a potential jump in nanosecond or picosecond. And to, so that you can disturb the double layer and also trigger an electrochemical reaction at a, at a very, very high, at a very, very fast time scale. And, uh, and, and to sum up today's presentation, uh, uh, there's a few tips for starting the ATR series here in the lab or uh, with projects. Firstly, is to note the system and theories I've discussed. They are more into the ATR series. And there are a lot of uh, rich literatures uh, to read about for interest by philosophy and also about the ATR series. Next is to you will need to build and machine the cell uh, for the specific need. You, if you need a flow cell or if you need a specific glass cell so that you can see what's going on in the surfaces, definitely do that by yourself on, or discuss with a machine shop specialist. Next, also a hard part, you'll need to prepare the samples uh, depending on your needs, either as a uh, uh, electrical deposit samples or drop test sample. Always know uh, what's the positive and uh, characterize them uh, thoroughly with the available techniques and collect data under reaction conditions. And if you have access, access to other uh, techniques, definitely can pair it with gas chromatography and mass spectrometry because there are certain species that were below the detection limit of infrared spectroscopy. There are some species that will never be observed with uh, uh, infrared spectroscopy. So definitely do this if you can. And of course, be patient with the, um, building out this technique because it will take really long to even building up the, the instrumentation and also knowing how you can collect them uh, effectively. And uh, this is the end of my presentation. So I will accept any, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, this is my end of my presentation and I'm happy to take any question if you like. Thank you. <clears throat> Excellent, uh, very good, thank you. Uh, Jerry, for a very informative presentation. I really liked uh, your pace. Um, it was, the diagrams really helped me in understanding the research you're doing. So very well done. Um, so everyone, if you have questions, please use the, um, the chat here uh, and put your questions in the chat. So I see one question, what types of materials, semiconductors, liquids, gases, et cetera, can be measured using um, your discussed spectroscopy technique? So what states of matter will this work with? Um, so, uh, at least for the ATR series, it has been mostly limited right now to just a single metal catalyst. Okay. Just uh, gold, copper, silver, platinum. And there's also some efforts in uh, depositing some uh, commercially available catalysts, such as some platinum dispersing carbon and uh, also, people have tried electrical deposit some uh, more complex materials on that. Okay. And how, how do these electric catalysts improve like the selectivity of the reactions themselves? Yes. So, uh, so yeah, so let's, yeah, so let's just talk about a little bit about silver. 
Um, so, uh, so in, for example, in carbon dioxide reduction, there's usually a competing reaction with CO2 reduction, which is the hydrogen evolution reactions, because uh, hydrogen evolution reaction require fewer electrons. And so uh, it's, it will proceed at much more favorable uh, uh, potential thermodynamically. However, if you can tune the surfaces to uh, avoid the hydrogen evolution reaction, for example, if you can produce a hydrophobic uh, interfaces on top of a metal electrode, you can avoid the water absorption to the surfaces to terminate hydrogen evolution reactions so, so that you can favor more uh, CO2 to uh, absorb on the electrodes to, to proceed that. Okay, cool. Um, so we have a couple more questions that have come in. Um, so we'll, we'll do we'll do these last two, and then we'll proceed with the the remainder of the the webinar here. So the first one is: Do you study the response as a function of the nanoparticle morphology that produces the plasmons? Uh, do you mean like uh, studying the crystallographic directions, or do you study? Uh, can Can you clarify the question? Yeah, so I'll, I'll read it, I, I guess, uh, again here. So the, the question relates to the response as a function of the morphology of the nanoparticles. Uh, is it the electrode on the layer or the deposit? The positive. Uh, so if, if there's a nanostructure and it has different morphologies, mm -hmm. would that morphologies that also have plasmons, would that be, how would that be reflected into the Oh, I see. Serious. I see. Um, so usually, um, as I discussed, so um, for plasma resonances, uh, usually only the gold, silver, copper are considered the uh, the metals that were providing the much higher uh, resonance, but the other uh, common uh, metals like if you're studying iron, iron oxide, um, platinum, um, most other uh, metal nanoparticles usually won't have enough uh, enough power for to provide this platinum uh, enhancement. So there isn't too much worry about that. Um, so another question here is on on slide eight, which is the slide you're on right now. Um, is it possible to scale the potential to such an amplification so that it can be used for telescopes in order to detect near Earth asteroids? Um, so this kind of going the other way, going to a larger scale. Mm -hmm. uh, so what are your thoughts on that? Mm. Well, that's interesting. And uh, <laughs> I think uh, for ATR Ceres, uh, I think uh, it will be pretty challenging because um, uh, even even on the theory, it only can produce in ten to hundred fold enhancement. But maybe with the surface enhancement called a surface enhanced Raman scattering, which can produce like uh, ten to the fifth, fifth power or sixth power <laughs> enhancement of the signals. Um, at least you can see much smaller signals, but I doubt this. Enhancement can be a long range uh, signal enhancement. So uh, I don't think they work in the same system because it's uh, this signal enhancement is more about uh, nanoscale uh, uh, improvement, but not uh, okay. to in like light year unit. So uh, another question that I think is a pretty good one. It's a pretty, it's more of an experimental question related mm -hmm. to how you actually, you know, characterize this stuff. So. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit on how you actually apply the voltage on the working electrode when mm -hmm. you're taking the measurement? Like, what do you do experimentally? So uh, I'm not showing here the you know the software interface for the potential set. But basically, um, uh, potential set is an, an instrument that comes with a software in your computer. Uh, you have a uh, interfaces where you can uh, change the potential. And also change the current uh, by applying electricities into the 
into the uh, reaction cell. For example, if, if you can see my uh, uh, mouse, you will see that there are several uh, alligator clips to the, to the copper wire here, to the um, gold wire here, uh, and also to the reference electrode here, so that um, they're electrically con connected to another instrument. And they'll also be interfaced with the computer so that you can have a uh, precise control of the, the electrical potential. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you all for your, your, your very good questions. That We'll do one more. Um, so can we use this technique during the corrosion of steel reinforcement by chloride penetration? You, you, is there, can you repeat the question? Again? Sure. So the question relates to, you know, if we're able, can the, the technique that you've presented today, Mm -hmm. Can we use this during the corrosion of steel um, by reinforcement by chloride penetration? Um, yeah, it's certainly possible. Uh, uh, if you can, pr uh, the, the, the challenge will be to deposit a steel film on top of the gold film. Well, if it's possible that it doesn't peel off uh, from the electrode uh, in like minutes or hours of the experiments, and the film is not too thick or too thin. And uh, I think it's possible to study the corrosion mechanism of the seal. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Jerry, for, for your responses to the 